Uh, this poem is called St. Francis and the Sow. The bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower, for everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch blessings of earth on the sow, and the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail from the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through the great broken heart to the sheer blue milken dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the fourteen teats into the fourteen mouths sucking and blowing beneath them, the long, perfect loveliness of Sao. Well, I guess if I tried to tell the story of writing this, uh, it would be longer than the poem, and I don't think that's good. This poem is called uh, Daybreak. On the tidal mud, just before sunset, dozens of starfishes were creeping. It was as though the mud were a sky, and enormous imperfect stars moved across it as slowly as the actual stars cross heaven. All at once they stopped and as if they had simply increased their receptivity to gravity, they sank down into the mud, faded down into it, and lay still. And by the time pink of sunset broke across them, they were as invisible as the true stars at daybreak. Parkinson's disease. While spoon feeding him with one hand, she holds his hand with her other hand, or rather lets it rest on top of his, which is permanently clenched shut. When he turns his head away, she reaches around and puts in the spoonful blind. He will not accept the next morsel until he has completely chewed this one. His bright squint tells her he finds the shrimp she has put in delicious. She strokes his head very slowly, as if to cheer up each hair sticking up from its root in his stricken brain. Standing behind him, she presses her cheek to his, kisses his jowl, and his eyes seem to stop seeing and do nothing but emit light. Could heaven be a time, after we are dead, of remembering the knowledge flesh had from flesh? The flesh of his face is hard, perhaps from years spent facing down others until they fell back and harder from years of being himself faced down and falling back, and harder still from all the while frowning and beaming and worrying and shouting and probably letting go in rages. His face softens into a kind of quizzical wince, as if one of the other animals were working at getting the knack of the human smile. When picking up a cookie, he uses both thumb tips to grip it and push it against an index finger to secure it so that he can lift it. She takes him to the bathroom and when they come out, she is facing him, walking backwards in front of him, 
holding his hands, pulling him when he stops, reminding him to step when he forgets and starts to pitch forward. She is leading her old father into the future as far as they can go, and she is walking him back into her childhood where she stood in bare feet on the toes of his shoes and they fox-trotted on this same rug. I watched them closely. She could be teaching him the last steps that one day she may teach me. At this moment, he glints and shines as if it will be only a small dislocation for him to pass from this paradise into the next. Rapture. I can feel she has got out of bed. That means it is 7 a.m. I have been lying with eyes shut, thinking or possibly dreaming of how she might look if, at breakfast, I spoke about the hidden place in her which to me is like a soprano's tremolo. And right then, over toast and bramble jelly, if such things are possible, she came. I imagined she would show it while trying to conceal it. I imagined her hair would fall about her face and she would become apparently downcast as she does at a concert when she is moved. The hypnopompic play passes and I open my eyes and there she is next to the bed, bending to a low drawer, picking up various small, smooth, black, white, and pink items of underwear. She bends so low, her back runs parallel to the earth, but there is no sway in it. There is little burden. The day has hardly begun. The two mounds of muscles for walking, le leaping, love-making, lift toward the east. What can I say? Simile is useless. There is nothing like them on earth. Her breasts fall full. The nipples are deep pink in the glare, shining up through the iron bars of the gate under the earth, where those who could not love press, wanting to be born again. I reach out and take her wrist, and she falls back into bed and at once starts at, uh, and at once starts unbuttoning my pajamas later when i open my eyes there she is again rummaging in the same low drawer the clock shows 8 hmm with huge silent effort of great mounded muscles the earth has been turning she takes a piece of silken cloth from the drawer and stands up. Under the folds of hair, her face has become quiet and downcast, as if she will be all day among strangers, looking down inside herself at our rapture. This insomniac that's kind of nice. But I'll read Everyone Was In Love. Short poem. Everyone Was In Love. One day, when they were little, Maud and Fergus appeared in the doorway, naked and mirthful, with a dozen long garter snakes draped over, each of them like brand new clothes. Snake tails dangled down their backs, and snake foreparts in various lengths fell over their fronts, with heads raised and swaying, alert as cobras, the snakes writhed their dry skins upon each other, as snakes like doing in love-making, with the added novelty of caressing, soft, smooth, moist human skin. 
Maud and Fergus were deliciously pleased with themselves. The snakes seemed to be tickled, too. We were enchanted. Everyone was in love. Then Maud drew down off Fergus's shoulder, as off a tie rack, a peculiarly lumpy snake, and told me to look inside. Inside the double-hinged jaw, a frog's green webbed hind feet were being drawn like a diver's, very slowly, as if into deepest waters. Perhaps thinking I might be considering rescue, Maud said, don't. Frog is already elsewhere. And I'll read this uh, Insomniac. <clears throat> Insomniac. I open my eyes to see how the night is progressing. The clock glows green. The light of the last quarter moon shines up off the snow into our bedroom. Her portion of our oceanic duvet lies completely flat. The words of the shepherd in Tristan, waste and empty the sea, come back to me. Where can she be? Then in the furrow where the duvet overlaps her pillow, a small hank of brown hair shows itself, her marker that she's here, asleep somewhere down in the dark underneath. Now she rotates herself a quarter turn from strewn all unfolded on her back to bunched in a Z on her side with her back to me. I squirm nearer, careful not to break into the immensity of her sleep and lie there absorbing the astounding quantity of heat a slender body alverns up around itself her slow, purring, sometimes snorish, perfectly intelligible sleeping sounds abruptly stop. A leg darts back and hooks my ankle with its foot and draws me closer. Immediately her sleeping sounds resume, telling me, come, press against me, yes, like that. Put your right elbow on my hip bone, perfect, and your right hand at my breast, yes, that's it. Now your left arm, which has become extra, stow it somewhere out of the way, good, and tangled with each other so, unsleeping one, together we will outsleep the night. Yeah, my voice isn't right, quite right and tuned up. Do you feel a bit crooky? Huh? You feel a bit hoarse? It sounds a bit, uh, I don't know, strange to me. Hmm. Have some more <clears throat> beer. I'm, tr I'm hoping the beer will, uh, will <laughs> make it feel at home. 